This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I'm Chris Bentliff, and I am so happy today to be with Mike Batiste. He's a managing partner at Agency 580, and we're talking a little bit about uh, 580's relationship with Pro CFO Partners and and Mike spending just a little bit of time at, at your website one th- one of the things that i really like is um your focus is on commerce not e-commerce mm. because commerce all commerce is e-commerce and and you're not you're not you're not sort of pigeoning yourselves as a marketing agency there's a bigger story than that so i i want to hear your thoughts on that tell me a little bit about about uh, 580 and a little bit about what you do and how you do it yeah, that's a oof, is that a loaded question? And only because of how how quick and how rapidly this industry is changing. Um so 580 we're a commerce marketing agency and yep, that means uh buying through clicks, it means pushing a cart and pulling stuff off shelves. We as human beings, we are exposed to the products that we buy too many ways uh, on a daily basis before we make that decision or before we decide to change the brand of the type of product that we always buy and put in our cart. Um, And it's really interesting. And it's always been an evolving industry because of technology and human behavior and generational demographics. But on the back end of COVID, we really kind of saw... and an amplification and how, how quickly everything um, w- was sort of settling and finding its new normal. A lot of people learned how to shop on their mobile phone and, and shop digitally for stuff that they never would have bought that way because of, you know, lockdowns and quarantines. And it's really changed consumer behavior. Partner that with, um, I, I guess, AI. I'll just speak to you generally um, in how we're shown things, how much smarter every retailer is and knowing what my preference is and what I'm more likely to buy. Um, and week to week, our, our grocery carts don't look the same. The type of clothes that we're going after, the stores that we buy them for don't necessarily look the same. It's a really interesting time. And that kind of uh, varied work, that, that kind of um, variability um, is what attracts people to 580, our, our team that works here. And I can't sing their praises uh, enough, right? We, we like the ability to work on many different brands and many different challenges uh, in the space of commerce. And at the end of the day, we're providing shoppers with, you know, customized quality shopping experiences. We're not just pounding them with impressions until they buy or don't and then move on. That That's not what we're about at all. I mean, every single thing you're saying, I just, I love, and there's so much to unpack. Um, how do you sort of juxtapose the need to get the jobs done, right? We've got these projects, we've got these deadlines, we've got these initiatives, let's go, 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 with, as you describe, I mean, the dynamics of how people are buying and how they're exposed to buying options and, and how they're identifying themselves as customers. There was a time where you could sort of say, here's your persona, everybody. Let's put it on the wall and we can lock in on that. It changed. Next week, it'll be different. And a recommendation will do something you didn't expect. Or the technology that surrounds us with Amazon or with Google or whatever that gives us these recommendations will change their algorithms. And suddenly, we have to do stuff. How How do you strategically stay just ahead of that while also tactically offering what you can to your customers so that they are just getting all the things that they want to get from you. Where's that tension? You know, Chris, there's probably a dozen or more ways to effectively answer that question. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you the two that I think, you know, make the most sense. When we work in an industry like this, where where things are changing often, and that's not always the case, right? It could be five-year cycles, 10-year cycles. But right now, we're, we're kind of living in a world where we've seen two or three two-ish year cycles in a row. So things have been pretty volatile in, in like CPG marketing and advertising. Um, step step one is you can't 
always shoot your shot. You, you can't always be bringing the next big thing to the client saying, hey, here's how we're going to take your brand and, and go crazy with it. Uh, at the end of the day, we're working with human beings who have a job to do, want to do it well, and don't want to take an incredible amount of, of risks, right? They want to see steady growth in their client and their, their brands and their product sales and, and hit their goals. Um, so staying grounded to that, and we call it internally making our KPIs their KPIs, right? So we don't have separate agents KPIs of like, let's grow every client by 40% and let's do X, Y, and Z and let's take this brand and blow it out of the water because that misalignment is just going to create friction and, and ultimately all kinds of issues. Um, but we do have curious people here. We do sit on sort of like the front end of this, this evolution. So we continue to embrace technologies, finding efficiencies for us internally um, and sharing that with the client flat out. Hey, here's how we're using AI to create content at scale. Hey, we want to show you how we use 3D or CGI to bring something to life so you don't have to go do a, a six-figure content shoot to get product shots so that we can, you know, get the images necessary to get your buy going on Instacart. There's a lot of moving parts. It's just sort of about simplifying what's going to make the most sense, adhering to the rules of engagement, quality that the brand deserves, um, staying within the, the brand guidelines, um, and just not, not confusing it. There's a ton of great ideas that we leave on the cutting room floor on a mm -hmm. weekly basis here um, because they would just be – too cumbersome, too many moving parts internally at a brand or here, you know, to get them done. And that's okay. That, that's just the nature of how business works. Um, we do always like to sort of share and say, hey, look, here's your other things that we were thinking about. Let's make sure we keep them in the background in case an opportunity, you know, pops up so there's not waste, but not overcomplicating. And then last but not least is it takes a village. We, we have incredible partners that help us do these things. Um, it would be unrealistic to think that any one company is capable of staying up to date on all of the different spider legs that are coming out of advertising and marketing right now. You've got individual retailers building their own ad networks. Like they're built, they're built, they're launched. There's more and more on a daily basis, ways that you could buy in and move your product. Um, so now how you see challenger brands using that as opportunities to jump ahead. There's new types of, of hardware in the world. There's new types of billboards that allow for 3D ads. There's new screens at retail. So now the physical is digital. Uh, cookies are going away digitally. Everything is changing. And for us to sit here and just say, we as 580 only have to be the most knowledgeable in all of that, we would need six times as many people who are not doing client work, just sitting around doing R&D all day long, and it wouldn't be sustainable. So the partners that we have play a key role in their expertise, right? That's the beauty about being an independent. We are um, agile, we are fast, and we have the ability to bring our trusted partners to the table to help enhance the effort at a daily uh, on a daily basis. Um, and that goes above and beyond just what's happening in the marketing and advertising space, because we have to figure out operationally how to manage these things and product manage them, um, or project manage them, I should say. And ultimately, it, it's why even... Um, um, our relationship with like pro CFO is so important um, because I don't have an entire internal team here stuck in their ways that only knows X, Y, and Z that I have to bring up to speed on how we're going to fund the new era of ad units that didn't exist before and operates differently. I can tap into pro CFO, which is tapping into a team of, of CFOs to help bring those answers to the table in a record amount of time. Uh, thank you for handing me a segue on a silver platter. There's everything you just said I want to spend an hour talking about, but let's talk a little bit about ProSafe Partners because you you talk about the value of the team, but I also, uh, I love what you're talking about with the discipline to say no. I think that's a mark of high performance. Here are the things we're not going to, you know, put all our energy behind. And here are the things we're going to look for partners to so that we can stay focused on our sweet spot. How did that, uh, that sort of, Already an understanding, you know, already uh, an understanding of the value of that. Was that part of your process or your thinking or your deliberation when it came time for you to say, you know what, we need some sort of help in this kind of financial strategic area 
how do we go about that? Was it a, was part of your sort of process? Like, let's look for a partner who can be to us what we are to our, our customers, or was it not that elementary? Was it just sort of a random introduction? How did that, how did that relationship begin with ProCFO partners? And Tom McNiff was your, was your CFO. I, I'm curious how that all went. Yeah. I mean, the, the short answer is, is yes. Right. We look for partners who share in our values, right. Our values of uh, being competitive and our speed to market and really like embracing different perspectives. Um, and when you're a startup company, right. To add one person to have a one person department is limiting in that sense. Um, so there's really a lot of decision making and waiting that goes into it to ultimately determine like, okay, do we need a, you know, head of HR who's going to be a one person show with maybe a little bit of budget to outsource some of it, or do we want to just outsource all of it? So um, early on while weighing that, you know, you, you do your research, right? You, you, you ask around, you talk to people, pro CFO came so highly recommended from so many different people around me. I said, no, oh, of course I'll have, I'll have a conversation. Um, and what it was in the beginning that um, really showed me how seamless this was going to be was the process of aligning you with your, your fractional CFO, which was, uh, so I talked to Nelson first and I was like, Hey Nelson. So, you know, who, who's the person in New York, who am I going to potentially be working with? And he was like, Oh, that's that's not necessarily how we do it. And he's like, let me hear about you. Tell me about yourself, and then I'll figure out who would be the best match. Um, and I can't, I don't want to speak for what Nelson's criteria looked like, but I'm sure after that conversation, he was like, oh, okay, we got ourselves a first time CEO here who's going to struggle with decision making and need all kinds of detail. Who knows what he decided to write down? But aligning us with Tom um, really is a blessing that continues to pay dividends. So um, the amount of communication that has to happen from the, the C-level, right, in, up in the C-level, especially I would imagine with, with a first-time, you know, CEO, um, it's really important. And Tom and I share um, some similarities in our professional background, both coming from uh, the music industry. So we had a lot of common, a great foundation to jump off from without even having met each other. Right. And Nelson knew that and he connected the dots and relatively quickly. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people would say this about Tom because of how personally is you just feel like you, you've known him your whole life after five minutes of meeting him, but that was definitely the case. Um, and that made like, brainstorming that made the fear of asking a stupid question it just like everything became super simple and really easy um and i i mean i guess i've never tried to quantify it but thinking back we probably accomplished like four to five years worth of work in in a year and a half um really amazing instrumental work into uh, building our, our financial foundation of how we operate as a company, how we interact financially with our clients, which is varied because we do so many different services from, you know, marketing and design to advertising content. Um, it was uh, really a wonderful experience in, in putting all of that together. And as our world continues to change, um, what an amazing resource that I, I have to lean on um, and say, okay, here's what's new now. And now, now these ad networks require us to pay, I don't know, 365 days in advance, which feels like it's coming right around the corner. And clients don't want to give us any money until, you know, net 365 either. So how are we going to bridge those gaps? Um, and just a great solutions oriented organization that really meshed well with how we work, how we operate. Um, it was a wonderful match. What a cool uh, sort of story and analysis. Did you, I love what you share about, like I can ask stupid questions. There's always this intimidation um, for any of us where we, we are a specialist in something. We are the person who, who we enjoy when people ask us stupid questions because it's an opportunity to help but we have a trepidation of doing it ourselves. Did you find uh, just kind of a mental offload or even an emotional offload? Like, oh, there's a whole pile of stuff I don't necessarily need to either be internalizing or like worrying about. I at least have somebody I can bump this off of. I at least have somebody, or sometimes I can just be like, hey, can you tell me what you think? And I'm, I'm, I'll am I'm, talk to you on Tuesday about that. Like, how, how did that make you a better leader or a more effective or at least a more involved leader in the things that are your focus and your strengths. Yeah, it's it's all of those things. I think a, an emotional offloading is is the uh the way to say it. Um because the the time 
the timing of everything, right? So here we are, brand new company, the end of 2018, straight into COVID, straight into the great resignation. It was super hard to find talent, just like all of the things, right? So every year, um, thinking like, okay, we've got a great understanding of our finances. Oh, and then tax season comes around. Oh, we just learned a few things. We didn't really have it all figured out. Um, I, you know, I, I'm making way light of it. I'm talking like 60 days of pure anxiety, not being able to sleep at night. The, the emotions ran really hot. And I could look at it now and say like, oh, through experience, I don't have that anxiety anymore. But really it was through those around us and creating, uh, I think like through, through listening and then creating, um, and to be able to ask a stupid question or to be able, be able to be vulnerable and just say, talking about this makes me sick to my stomach. Worrying about that makes me worried and keeps me up at night. Not knowing when payments are going to come in versus going out, uh, is draining to me. I don't know how to tell my team when something is approved versus when it's not, you know, for, for any one particular business unit or client that we have, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately for all of that to come back to you relatively quickly, again, like I said, solutions oriented. Okay. If we create this, pull this data, look at this, have like a dashboard kind of thing or build a model, you'll be able to do that. Okay. But then what happens when, you know, we've got certain clients that have operate on a calendar year and others on a fiscal. Okay. No problem. Give me a couple of days. And just to be able to put all of that down, in you know whether it it existed in many different material things a financial model uh different plans processes um you name it um there's just such comfort around it now and now we project out farther than we ever have we project our years and we 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 come in like within 10 or fifteen thousand dollars of it's just it's so amazing to see it all happen um and with with that goes away all of the anxieties, all of the worries, and it's just refilled. It's it takes its place as confidence um, in the decisions that you're making and how you're operating. It's it's fantastic. Mike Batista is at uh, Agency 580, 580. They're at Agency 580.com. Spell five and spell eighty. Agency 580.com. Uh, Mike. I could talk to you for two hours. So, you know, maybe someday I'll just call you up and we'll just talk for two hours, but thank you so Deal. much for, for this conversation and, uh, and for sharing with, with such candor, the experience you've had with Tom and with ProCFO partners, uh, it, this, these sorts of conversations are just always such a highlight for me. It's so fun to, to see the backside of all the effort that goes in and that we talk all the time about, uh, with our, with our CFOs over here. So thanks Mike. And, um, all the best, all the best to you and, and, and success for 580. Thank you, Chris. Have a good one. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.